The world of reporting from the former Soviet sphere has been turned on its head. No longer do journalists based in Moscow report on the affairs of the wider region. Kiev is now the ground zero of narratives emerging from that region, and a Moscow-centric lens has shifted to become a Ukrainian lens for much of the Western media. There are now relatively few Western voices on the ground in Russia, so how can the media remain objective and avoid the bias that comes from that lack of first-hand reporting? Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. Please like and subscribe so more people can discover the wonderful guests on the channel. James Rogers is an Associate Professor in International Journalism and Assistant Vice President of Global Engagement at City University of London. He is an academic, veteran journalist and author of the fascinating book Assignment Moscow, reporting on Russia from Lenin to Putin. He has also written incisively about reporting on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and is an expert on the reporting of armed conflict and journalism in history. He is also widely published in online print and media publications and academic journals, including NBC Think, History Today, The New European and the British Journalism Review. And before we start, uh, James, I should say this is our second opportunity I've had to grill you, which is amazing. It is, Jonathan. It's very nice to be back. Thank you for the invitation. Now, I know you are working on an update of your book, and I know uh, there's probably more still to do before the publication date. But could you tell me, why did you feel that the book needed to be uh, know, overhauled and reissued? Well, in one word, Ukraine. <clears throat> I mean, uh, the book was originally published uh, in the summer of 2020. And obviously, you know, look back on a, on a history and a whole century of reporting from Russia, beginning with Russia's revolutionary year of 1917, going right through the Soviet period and beyond. But obviously, uh, what has happened in the last 12 months, particularly you know, the start of the war in Ukraine in February, has completely transformed relations between Russia and the West. It was a frequent question when I was um, working in Moscow in the 1990s and the 2000s, it was a frequent question in live interviews when there were crises in relations between Russia and the West. Is this a post-Cold War low? And there were various people who cited that low in relations that having come at different stages. But of course, now without question, we know exactly when that happened. It happened on February the 24th. Uh, this year, and it's transformed everything. And that, of course, includes the way that international news organisations have been forced to adapt their working practices there. And talking about that sort of low point, I mean, it feels in some ways that we're at a new post-Stalin era low. In fact, there was more agreement with Stalin, it has to be said, and there was more adherence to treaties once they were signed with Stalin than with Putin. I mean, is that that sounds absurd, but in some ways he's less easy to deal with. I think in some ways, Jonathan, that's a very reasonable assessment. If I think back, when I first went <clears throat> to the Soviet Union in 1987 as a language student, um, and then, of course, you know, I was, you know, being in my 50s now, I was very much brought up, grew up during the Cold War era. But looking back, you know, having worked there as a journalist and looking back now as a historian, you know, there were at least rules. And let's not forget, you know, how Stalin is remembered in the West now, you know, as the, the uh, architect of that um, <clears throat> mass system of murderous um, prison camps. Nevertheless, you know, during the Second World War, the Soviet Union, the United States, the United Kingdom were very firm allies. So that, of course, didn't survive the end of the war and those ideological differences re-emerged. But, you know, there were at least rules there in that sense. Um, and I think, you know, just to take a simple example, how long is it going to be, do we imagine, until you can take a direct flight from London or Paris, Berlin, uh, to Moscow again? It's it's something that we just can't foresee. So that's the level that we've arrived at, something which was quite unforeseeable 30 years ago, uh, and, and which really has, you know, thrown away and thrown aside and destroyed everything that happened uh, with the end of the Cold War. The Cold War being... Um, a period of great tension in international relations, but at least when there was this understanding, mutual respect, and as you say, respect for treaties. Mm. And I think it's forgotten as well that there was a huge exchange of expertise, uh, nonetheless, through parts of the Cold War, even in the 1930s in the industrialization of the Soviet Union. Uh, a lot of experts from the US uh, helped build factories across Russia. Um, 
And it sort of struck me and, and the trade as well in a huge trade, whether it be in wheat, oil, hydrocarbons, despite the tensions of the Cold War, underpinning it was massive flows of trade uh, going between the countries. Yeah, I mean, in, in some states, well, I mean, that, that, of course, was less of an issue. That, uh, big, those flows have become even greater in the last 20 or 30 years in terms of energy exports, uh, food exports, et cetera, et cetera. And now that's gone not quite to zero. I mean, we've seen, of course, you know, we're, we're going to see uh, in the coming weeks whether this idea of the energy cap on the price of, of, of Russian oil works. Um, but th that is the thing. This was this. In a way, um, you know, Russia and the West were integrated in trade terms over the last 30 years, more than they had been at any time, you know, since Tsarist Russia was a major exporter of wheat. Uh, so we really are entering an entirely new age and one in which you know, there really are very few rules and where, where there is sort of zero cooperation. I mean, there are even, you know, questions about, um, you know, when will we next see uh, Russian artists performing in the West, for example? I mean, again, even something like that is, is really, really hard to foresee at the moment. And you'll, you'll know from sort of living and working in Russia, I mean, Russians who principally it was Russians I would have known, uh, but now I know a lot of Ukrainians. And it's interesting to compare. There's there's a sort of uh, not not in everyone, of course, because that that would be sort of painting everybody with a, with an unfair brush. But there's a certain imperial swagger, isn't there? There's a certain arrogance and a certain self confidence that Russians will often have. And when you're living in the country, um, uh, you know, a lot of pride in 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 certain things. Um, but nonetheless, I think you know, in the nineties when I was there, in the period of the nineties and two thousand, you were there. You could have a conversation with people. You didn't necessarily get the sense of individual hostility, um, even if you had disagreements about certain points. Um, there seems to be a toxic, charged level to the dialogue now, uh, probably instigated by propaganda. Do you, do you have much connection with Russians? Do you sort of sense a change in how individuals might relate to you, or do you just not have enough connection anymore? I don't really have enough connection. I mean, if I'm honest, the only Russians I've spoken to at any great length in the last sort of eight or nine months have been Russians who are living in the West, uh, and in some cases, Russians who personally would find it quite difficult to go back there now. Uh, and so um, I don't really have that sense anymore, and I, and I don't know when it will next be that I will feel safe to go and you know walk the streets of Moscow or any other Russian city or town and just have a casual conversation. Of the kind that assisted me so greatly in you know in learning about the country because i just don't see those opportunities returning unfortunately um i think it's gonna be a very long time until it's safe to travel there and all those things that i was able to do as a correspondent all those things that the correspondents who i've you know written about in my work were able to do are really to a very very large extent off limits now mm -hmm. um you know travel is out of the question and if i'm completely honest jonathan i'm not sure i would feel safe um Returning to Russia now, I think there's the prospect, uh, you know, of people being taken hostage even possibly, you know, because of the poor state of relations. Um, so I wouldn't, I'm afraid, feel um, safe to go there at the moment because of the very, very poor state uh, of political relations between uh, Russia and, and my country, the UK in particular. And as a historian, I mean, the last 20 years have seen a uh, flood of archives potentially open to historians, um, or 30 years rather. Um, and that has changed fundamentally how history is written, maybe more subtle, more nuanced, more evidence based histories. Of course, at the moment, it's impossible to go and see those archives and engage with those first hand resources. And uh, I met a writer who writes about sort of spy matters uh, earlier in the week. And he said that that's a massive problem, because if you want to write about, you know, Cold War espionage, you have to go to first party sources uh, and they're only available in Moscow. Yeah, I think that's true. I think it's going to be a real, real challenge for scholarship um, in the coming years, because I think uh, you know, it's very difficult for Russian scholars to travel. It's very different for Western scholars to travel to Russia. And also that sort of golden age, if it was such a thing, when those archives were open at the end of the Soviet period, I think they, they are closed again for the foreseeable future. I think there's a sense, I mean, particularly for people, travellers to Russia of my generation, that I've been extremely fortunate. You know, I got to go to Russia first, and Soviet Union as was, in the period of Gorbachev's reforms. I saw the whole country's transition 
But, you know, with a few exceptions, you know, a couple of times we got into trouble as a journalist, really there was very few um, restrictions ever put on where I could go or who I could speak to. And that is no longer the case. Now, there have been periods in Russia's history where it's sort of cut itself off from the world, um, where it's been difficult for people to go there. And, and so I, I, I have a sense, you know, someone um, of my age, with my experience of really having had, had this privileged view on the country during one of the periods in its history when it was open to Western ideas. And, and as I say, I think it was quite impossible to foresee at the end of the Cold War mm -hmm. that relations would deteriorate quite so suddenly, so rapidly and so drastically as unfortunately they have in the last few years and particularly in the last nine or ten months. Mm. I mean, in some respects, Belarus, which is um, uh, has uh, prefigured Russia's descent uh, into, as you say, uh, more of a closed, highly repressive society. And we had Belarus really, you know, in that place over the last 10 years, extreme repression. Um, and anyone of a liberal, well, liberals, teachers, intelligentsia have basically either gone into hiding or fled the country. And as late as uh, I think January this year, or even naturally no, during the course of the war, there were still very well informed Russian commentators saying, "Well, you know, at least we're not Belarus. At least we're not going to descend to that level." But I think, I think Putin is rapidly caught up. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be really interesting to see how how things go in Russia. I mean, it's my view that for the longer term this war is probably going to be very very costly for Russia but there's no sign at the moment and, and of course you know many people would point to the fact that um, the Ukrainian army has performed better on the battlefield than was, was um, expected it would be wrong to or ignore the fact that that is to a large extent down to western weapon supplies without which Ukraine probably couldn't have kept going this long mm. I mean I'm not a, a military expert but I mean that's pretty much clear for people to see um, but I think it is also true to say, uh, and we've seen these, you know, leaked intelligence reports of, of course, about which one must be very sceptical always, um, suggesting, you know, this was supposed to be over in 10 days. And certainly that's the way that it felt back in February, that that was the plan, that this would all be over very quickly. Um, but I think it would be wrong for us to think that just because it wasn't over quickly then doesn't mean to say that Russia will not continue to try to prevail and to, exceed, to achieve its objectives. I mean, now that this war has been going on, as I say, for nine or ten months and winter is approaching, you know, the coldest, uh, most challenging part of the year in many ways, people are talking about how long this can go on. And you can see some people are saying, well, it's only really got months to go and you know, others are, are a lot more cautious. Uh, but I don't think, you know, there's any sign that there is any sort of settlement inside. And it's difficult to see at this stage one side prevailing entirely over the other. But I don't think um, that this is going to serve Russia well in the longer term. And I don't think it's going to serve Vladimir Putin well in the longer term. Um, I mean, I think if we think back, you know, to 2014, and the annexation of Crimea, wildly popular then, and that, that was, a, in a sense, you know, uh, widely popular in Russia, of course, quite the opposite elsewhere. Um, but I think that was a sense, you know, from Putin's Russian nationalist history point of view, that was his chance to go down in history as he saw it, as, as the Tsar, if you like, who liberated Crimea. And I suspect that um, even Russian nationalist history will not be quite uh, so generous to him uh, in the future. I think that's true. If he'd bowed out in 2014, uh, he'd suppressed Bolotna, he'd uh, taken Crimea, and as, as you say, I say rightly or wrongly, from our perspective, wrongly, of course, because it breaks international law and it breaks uh, the post-World War II uh, sort of conventions, really, on uh, respecting sovereignty. But from his point of view, and from many Russians' point of view, that was a positive step. If he'd resigned at that point, you know, I can imagine we'd be setting A-level history papers, wouldn't we, in the future? You know, Putin, tyrant or quasi-democrat or Russian hero or whatever... Um, you can conceive of him not being judged quite so harshly. And yet, now we see the actions in Ukraine, we can go back and look at his other actions over the last uh, two decades. And they now seem to build up into a pattern of behaviours from mm. Chechnya to Aleppo to wiping, wiping out opponents like Politkovskaya and Nemtsov and many others. Now it's building up a coherent picture of his character and behaviour. And it's it's not going to be judged kindly, is it? 
Yeah, I mean, one of my more recent academic papers was written um, with a colleague, uh, Dr. Alexander Lanoshka of the University of Waterloo in Canada, who we looked uh, in that, published in the academic journal um, Media, War and Conflict. We looked at um, Russia's use of the military uh, and, and its communication power in the wars, particularly in Chechnya and, and Georgia. And, you know, our core argument was that on each occasion, Russia had learned from its mistakes and addressed them and in terms of both media control, propaganda power, and addressing the shortcomings in the military, um, had sought to address those and, and moved to the next level. We didn't look at Syria in great detail, but it, it was very much that. Um, and this paper was published in the summer of 2021. You know, it was a while ago before you know, we could see uh, what was going to be happening. I mean, clearly that, that sort of research uh, is something that would be worth returning to now. But in a sense, you know, it, you know, we have seen that, you know, move really up to the next level from going back to, you know, the kind of war that we simply haven't seen in, in Europe, a mass invasion by one country or another that we haven't seen since the Second World War. And also, I mean, I think this is the interesting thing, you know, attempts to place 20th century restrictions on 21st century media, which I think, you know, from a Russian point of view has, you know, it pains me as a journalist to say this, has been to a very large extent successful. There are ways to circumvent it. You know, we've all seen those um, figures for the number of um, VPNs that have been downloaded in Russia since the start of the war and so on. So people are circumventing it. But let's not forget, Jonathan, in order to do that, you need a, a modicum of technical knowledge. And you also have to have the desire to do it, which is, you know, many people don't. Many people, you know, we see that as far as one can tell from outside the country, you know, the, the narratives of state television are still being, you know, put out and are still convincing large swathes of the population, even if they are, particularly since the mobilisation, concerned about the way that things seem to be going on the battlefield. And um, a, a Russian activist I was speaking to actually last night made this point incredibly effectively. It's, um, you know, Simonyan, uh, Solovyov, the main propagandistic talk shows, the really highly competitive, often pro-genocidal, horrific you know scenarios those are the ones that get shared on twitter all the time the viewership for those have been going down steadily through the war um so people are many people are turning off tuning out to the propaganda um it seems from what little social research there is that it's a relatively small minority 15 to 20 percent who are really actively gung-ho or have quite an extreme nationalist point of view that, that's still a lot of people but it's not a majority i think the activists made the point that it's not enough to be passive. It's not enough to switch off and just go into survival mode or look for other means of entertainment, which is a lot of people will be doing that. You know, well, let's go out and do something else. Let's go for a walk in the park. Let's go to a restaurant and try and forget this reality. That, to an extent, is, um, I know from the German example uh, in the in in the fascist era, that's not really an option for solving the problem, is it, if people tune out? <laughs> No, it's not. I mean, but and remember too, you know, that I think tuning out is probably the option for most people in Russia now, given that any form of active opposition or political protest is is or is next to impossible, or certainly very very risky. Um, and it's difficult, you know, without having. I haven't been uh, in Moscow for three years now, and, and it'll probably be a very long time until I go again. So without getting that sense of being able to walk around the city and seeing what the day-to-day -day life is there, which is quite difficult to ascertain that. But, um, you know, you can imagine, I think probably a lot of people, that, you know, going back to the point that we were discussing earlier about the expectation at the outset of the war, that it was supposed in Kremlin planning terms to be over within a matter of days, a view that was confirmed by these um, leaked uh, intelligence reports we've seen in the last sort of week or so. And then we had the mobilization. So a lot of people are suddenly thinking, oh, goodness, this isn't a special military operation. I mean, that phrase is very, very carefully chosen. If you think about it, you know, it's very similar in Russian. Um, special, so something for specialists, something that ordinary people need not concern themselves with. You know, and we hear a specialist like a medical specialist. We feel reassured because it means that something uh, is in the hands Being of taken experts. care of, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then suddenly it wasn't because of the mobilisation. But it doesn't mean to say that society can't sort of absorb that. Uh, and, you know, let's not forget around that time that major mobilisation was announced in September, anything between um, 
quarter of a million, three quarters of a million men are thought to have left Russia. You know, so that you know, these people were were allowed to leave. Um, men of military age, one imagines, because they were thought to be protest risks, and you know, very much if you're not with us, you're against us, kind of thing. They were allowed to leave. So, um, you know, it it is uh, it is a. a it's difficult for people to be actively opposed, but it doesn't mean to say that you know, there aren't people who are still quite committed to this and do think that, you know, do buy the Kremlin's narrative that actually, you know, they're fighting against the West, they're fighting against NATO, and it's an existential threat to Russia, which of course seems absolutely absurd viewed from here. But if enough believe, people believe it within the borders of the Russian Federation, then that is sufficient public morale to keep the war going. And there are there are voices uh, in the West, um, uh, not so much journalists, but commentators um, who who parrot that message as well. And there is some well-known voices, Mir Shima being being one, um, Mr. Hitchens being another one there who uh, they have slightly different nuances on it. But again, this idea of the existential threat and somehow this aggression was inevitable because we pushed them too far, etc., taking some of the culpability from Putin's shoulders. It's not just propaganda where we see these kind of arguments. No, I mean, I think that's going to be a key question to be answered by historians in years to come. Was this conflict inevitable? I mean, it's 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 too early. You know, obviously, it's pretty clear in my mind where we can apportion blame for the war. The, the blame the blame for the war lies with the Kremlin. But it, was there anything? You know, there are questions about you know whether Western policy could have been smarter, if only to see this coming and try to, to. Because I don't think until those intelligence reports that we were getting in the weeks leading up to the war, which turned out to be uncannily accurate in many cases, the only things that were wrong with the dates, and one could imagine those might have been changed as a result of this information having come into the public domain. Uh, but there are, I mean, nobody, but nobody, but nobody wanted to see this 30 years ago at the end of the Cold War. So therefore, um, is it simply, uh, you know, were there Western policies that could have been made better or differently in order to avoid this coming to pass, you know, without obviously sacrificing Ukraine? I think that's going to be a very big question to answer. And let's also remember this, Jonathan, one day, um, you know, one day the rest of Europe and the wider West is going to have to deal with Russia again. You know, it's not simply going to go away. And it may be that relations are going to be very, very poor for 10, 20 years. Uh, but there has going to have to be a means, uh, a way of, of living together again, um, of the kind that, you know, we thought we were going to have at the end of the Cold War when this absolutely not three decades later come to pass. I think it's going to be even more challenging because um, communist propaganda, you know, communist propaganda, well, Soviet mythology is harder to, uh, uh, you know, rid yourself of. But communist propaganda is very easy because I get the impression a lot of people in Russia didn't really believe it anyway. It was just sort of, you know, water off a duck's back. You can't uh, escape it. It's being piped into your kitchen uh, via a radio that you can't even switch off. It's on every train and every station and every street. So you tune it out. So in effect, when that fell, when that system collapsed incredibly rapidly, I think people were able to uh, shun off the basic propaganda because uh, it had ceased to make sense to them. Nationalist propaganda that we're seeing now is in some ways more pernicious, more pervasive, because it taps into a, a deeper desire for, uh, you know, national authority, national cohesiveness, uh, and even, um, dare I say, a sort of imperial uh, desire that uh, we've spent the better part of a century trying to rid ourselves of uh, imperfectly, but that process doesn't even seem to have begun uh, in Russia to face up to its imperial past yeah i mean i think i, I think I'm, I'm quite sure a lot of listeners will be familiar with the work of Sergei plochy and that you know his book about the end of the soviet union is called the last empire exactly he's not saying his argument is not that there won't be any more empires but this was the last of you know a series of empires that you know lasted through various states of the 20th century you know including the british and ottoman empires but i think it is something that's not really been come to terms with it. And we see the terms in which this has been couched. You know, it is very much, very, very much unfinished business from the collapse of the Soviet Union. 
mm. which for most commentators was the Russian Empire. I mean, territorially, it wasn't that different. It wasn't the same, but there was a lot of overlap. If you were to lay a map of the Russian Empire over a map of the Soviet Union, they wouldn't be hugely different. Um, but it was really just the Russian Empire in a, in a, in a different form. And I think that probably ne that, that never was come to terms with. People you know, don't always come to terms uh, with their history just because they're, they're forced to change it. And I think, mm. um, you know, the return, the annexation of Crimea and the response to that is possibly one of the clues uh, that the West missed, just how wildly popular that was. If you remember... You know, the Levada Center opinion polls, you know, a, a very respected polling organization in Russia, uh, particularly uh, before the current war. Um, and Putin's popularity, and this is after he had been at the top of Russian politics already for 15 years, by which time most leaders in democracies would be off the stage. I mean, if we think about how long our recent prime ministers in this country have lasted, for example, that's astonishing longevity. Nevertheless, his personal popularity rating touched 85% in the, in the wake of that. So I think with hindsight, Western policymakers could have better understood that um, just how popular some of these... I mean, Crimea occupies a particular place you know, in the Russian popular imagination, but it was very much seen as redressing a wrong that had been done to Russia. Hmm. Um, by the West and its allies at, at, the, at the collapse of um, Soviet power. And so I think, you know, there is an element of that, you know, that, 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 that probably could have been taken into account to, to, to a greater extent to try to anticipate this. I mean, I, I actually wrote, I wrote a piece a couple of years ago when, when there was that national vote, which had the effect of constitutional change to extend the, uh, the, um, the, the presidential terms, most notably in Russia. And um, I remember suggesting at the time that Putin needed new ideas, and I argued in the piece that you know, he had. The first 10 years have been characterized by rising living standards. After that, you know, looking at um, Georgia, looking at Syria in particular, that uh, you know, military campaigns have also proved popular because Georgia said this is a red line for NATO, put very simply. Syria said this is Russia back on the world stage. You know, looking after it, supporting its allies, in this case, um, President al-Assad of Syria. So I asked in this piece, you know, Putin has got this chance to stay in power, now he needs new ideas. And obviously I have, you know, my answer now as to what those new ideas were. But in effect, you know, there's no, you know, there's this farewell to rising living standards, but really going overdrive on, on military campaigns. And that, that's a calculation he would have made, um, not as a bogeyman or an irrational monster, but he would have looked at statistics. He would have looked at a whole range of uh, social indicators. And I think this is something else the West has missed. You know, it may be an autocracy. They may uh, falsify elections. They may have a massive police state apparatus. But at the same time, they obsessed over... Um, data over uh you know opinion poll data uh, and uh you know every single issue every single policy was trialed uh through uh the propagandist tv channels was trialed perhaps on a smaller scale uh and then uh they they didn't do anything for most of that time without sort of testing in much the way a marketeer might do that which strikes me as quite a rational approach cynical yes but uh rational well, all, you know, all leaders of whatever nature, democracies or others, are ultimately accountable to popular opinion. I mean, it's, it's no secret that having seen, you know, some of the political upheavals, you know, the so-called colour revolutions in different parts of, you know, of the former Soviet Union, or if we still use that phrase now, the former, you know, part of that, that particular incarnation of the Russian Empire, that was something that made um, the Russian political elite extremely nervous. I remember, you know, it's hard to, it's strange to imagine this, Jonathan, but I remember covering demonstrations um, led by Gary Kasparov in, the two, in about 2007, 2008, around that time. Putin, hugely popular, you know, this really were sort of tiny in numbers, dissident terms. I remember discussing with somebody who worked in the Kremlin. He said to me, why, and I was a BBC correspondent, so he said, why do you cover these things? There's about 1,500 people there. And I said, yeah, I know there's about 1,500 people there in a city of eight or 10 million, however much, I don't know if we're going to count the population. The story for us is, 
that when those 1500 people come out on the street, there are about 2000 riot police as well. And so that is the story for us. That is why it's interesting. If it was Gary Kasparov and a few of his well-meaning supporters waving flags, holding placards in the central Moscow, Moscow Square, believe me, we would not be turning up on a Saturday afternoon to, to film that. But the fact, what does for us make it newsworthy is the huge power of the state that's brought to bear just to keep an eye on them. Um, I mean, our, and, and the work, you know, and it was the classic thing, the riot policemen, the ones I got to talk to were all brought from outside Moscow. And, you know, uh, you know, one of them said to me, he said to me, if you work on a Saturday, do you get an extra day off? And I said, do you get, do you get paid extra? And I said, no, I don't. I said, I might get an afternoon off during the week. My job not to do this. Oh, well, we get paid extra. And that, that, I mean, it was a sort of flippant, lighthearted conversation in very different times. But something stayed with me then. That, you know, this right policeman and his comrades obviously felt they were well looked after. And I think that's a very important thing to take into account as we consider what the possible future of um, President Putin's administration may be. There have been absolutely no signs so far of the kind you'd expect in any sort of you know, collapse of a regime or semi-revolutionary situation of anything but complete loyalty and security forces. But if he can't pay them, if he can't pay them, that loyalty... Um, yeah, I mean, I suspect that he probably deep. can, though. I mean, I think this is probably... Been, even if this hasn't gone according to plan, I think, you know, um, I think that the... Uh, you know, there, there are still... Russia is still making a lot of money from oil exports. Uh, and I think, you know, the... And, and you know, as the last... If the last 30 years or first... Certainly the first 10 years after communism have shown anything, the Russian population will put up with an awful lot in terms of, of hardship on day-to-day -day life. Well, my last question, because I know uh, I know you have to sort of rush, and that is turning back to something we, we we touched on earlier, and that is the lack of journalists on the ground in in Moscow now. Um, it's much harder to get accreditation. Far fewer people probably want to be there. Uh, it probably doesn't feel safe. It feels unsafe in the way that reporting on Ukraine is risky. But you know, what's your sense there? How many eyes on the ground do we have in the Western media, and is this going to be a real problem? Uh, the answer is not many, and yes, it is going to be a real problem eventually, I'm afraid. I mean, you mentioned um, at the beginning, Jonathan, we started off talking about the way that I've revised the book. I've obviously done interviews with a number of Moscow correspondents, some of whom you know, are no longer there. So you, you know, many Western journalists fled, uh, decided to leave the country when, frankly, uh, you, in the worst case scenario, could face 15 years in jail for calling a war. And so I think, you know, while that kind of expertise is still resident here, there are still access to sources in, within the country. But, you know, I think that just the scenario painted of walking around the streets, talking to people, that's how you get real stories as a foreign correspondent. Yes, of course, you, you need to be in touch with political elites, but you need to see what people are talking about. You know, what are they selling in the shops? All these little details. Uh, one of the pe people... Um, I interviewed one of the correspondents I interviewed for, for the first edition of the book, the now sadly late Robert Elphick, who was a correspondent there in the late 1950s. And I remembered um, Yuri Gagarin going into space in 1961. And he said it was the first time he'd ever seen um, oranges for sale in Tvieskaya, as it was called, and used to be called, or was then called Gorky Street. And uh, because, you know, in celebration, the Soviet authorities had made available this very rare food stuff. So just little things like that, you know, is a story. But I think it is going to be difficult because um, the people who, the men and women who've written about Russia throughout its history uh, have done so through a knowledge of the language, through a knowledge of the country, through a knowledge of the culture. And that is obviously cult constantly changing and deprived of that. Yes, you can offer analysis because, of course, you know, everyone who's worked in Russia in the last 20 plus years has been there while President Putin has been President Putin. But, um, you know, that this is something which has transformed Europe, but of course it's going to transform Russia too. And without being able to see that in, in great detail, um, you know, we are not getting as audiences, you know, everything that we could really do with hearing from Russia. And as Russian voices dim, um, in terms of media, in terms of the attention people actually want to lavish on, uh, you know, Russian um, expression of whether it be culture or whatever, um, Ukraine has opened up as a a bright, 
new vista, hasn't it? I mean, it was an unknown territory, an unknown people for 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 most of the media, um, and 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 almost lost to history. Now it's it's emerged as an incredibly vivid, stoical, combative, stubborn. You know, there's any number of words you can apply to Ukraine uh, now, and it's coming into its own. Yeah, well, it's actually one of my formative memories from uh, reporting from the region in early September 1991, just after the uh, the failed coup against Mikhail Gorbachev. Um, I was in Ukraine uh, working for Reuters Television, a news agency, uh, you know, just to see what the reaction was going to be of one of you know the big and hugely significant constituent parts of what was still then just about the Soviet Union, but was only going to be for really a matter of weeks longer. And I remember being um, in the central square outside the Ukrainian parliament building the day that the deputies voted to remove the, the flag of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic and replace it with that which is much more familiar today, the, the yellow um, and blue of the, the, the cornfields in the sky. And I remember being on the square when that flag was raised and people were singing you know, Ukrainian songs around and, and marching towards us. And that left with me an indelible impression of this sense of, of nationhood. And of course, Jonathan, you know, history tells us that one of the things that forges the strength of nationhood is often war. So if, if this is going to do anything, however it ends, this war has clearly left not just Ukraine, but the rest of Europe and the rest of the world with a very strong sense of Ukrainian nationhood. Well, that's probably a good a good place to end on there. I think uh, it's right to end on Ukraine and its ascendancy into the um, family of democratic nations. And in fact, is the new front line of Europe. You know, if, if Ukraine falls, then the rest of European democratic values come under considerable threat and duress. Um, well, I really appreciate you spending a bit of your precious time uh, updating us. And I very much look forward to the book coming out. And um, when it does, we can go back and put a, a link in the description to the video. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I look forward to that.